Thank you very much. Um, welcome to everybody. A um, couple of things first. Um, I, I am a, a, a Mexican in Chicago. I'm not a, a Chicago Mexican. I wasn't born in the city. It's not that I am uh, proud of that, but you know, as it happens, I was born in a town in which most of the people, most of men older than 18, ended up in Chicago. Uh, I'm from La Piedad. And when I started to study historically the presence of Mexicans, it turned out that I found all these names that I already knew from the town I was born. And, and so I'm not going to talk about, and uh, uh, this is as, as a matter of uh, uh, excuse, I'm not going to talk about uh, how, is it to feel, how it feels to be a Mexican from Chicago or try to talk about uh, feelings or identities about here. Um, no. I'm going to start, or we are going to try to do something, departing from a very, uh, not very controversial issue. Uh, Chicago is a very important Mexico city. Mexican city as important, yes, not as important as Mexico city, maybe not as important as Guadalajara, maybe not as important as Monterrey, but that's it. Then Los Angeles, then Chicago. Uh, so this is a Mexican city. You want to you want to go to Pilsen and figure out why, or you want to go to la um, to other uh, Mexican dress, uh, Mexican neighborhoods and figure out why, or you can wait until five o'clock here and see why Mexico uh, Chicago is a Mexican city, or you can come a little bit earlier and talk to me and see why Chicago is a Mexican city. Uh, uh, it is a Mexican city. There is nothing to do about that now. That's very not a problem. Now, out of this big, not very controversial issue, we want to give you two different vistas. One very historical, the other also historical, but more architectonical. The first one is, I, I'll give, I'm going to provide it to you, and the second, my colleague, Sara Lopez, will give it to you. And my, my pr basic question is, um, I am a historian, and departing from something as uncontroversial as that Chicago is today a Mexican city, if you ask the, the, the consulate, I mean, Mexicans with Mexican passport, there are more than uh, near a million in the area of Chicago. I'm not talking about Mexican-Americans. I'm talking Mexicans with a Mexican passport. Um, um, it's very controversial. I want to embark in a brief historical examination of five related questions. Why Chicago? Why so early? Why so much, so many, and above all, why out of all these social scientists and policy makers, especially centered in the University of Chicago, came out with the idea that Mexicans are equal to the Mexican problem? If you think it's in controversial and it's not a problem to say Mexico, uh, Chicago is a Mexican city. Now, it's another thing to say, why Chicago? If you think Chicago now, you think, well, because you know Mexicans, Mexicans are everywhere. The problem is, I'm telling you, Chicago has been a Mexican city forever. That is, if you say, no, in 1800, no. In 1800, no. But in 1800, Chicago was not Chicago. OK? Uh, after it was burned and reconstructed, soon after, by 1916, the number of Mexicans here were nearly 15,000, 16,000, which is a lot if you think that the entire population of Mexico was 15 million and that Chicago was so far away. To have Mexicans in, in California or in Texas, well, after all, they were there before, and they were always been there, but in Chicago, so far away. It's extraordinary that since the early moment, they were here. That is, the question is, the, 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 the thing becomes a bit more complicated if I tell you, it's not that Chicago is a Mexican city, it's that Chicago has always been a Mexican city. That's more complicated. Um, but why? By already in 1930s, uh, Mexican Chicago was equal to 1920s Ciudad Juarez. There is 1930 Chicago was at the size of Ciudad Juarez in 1920, about 40,000 people. It's a lot of people if you consider that it's so far away. Uh, there are other two other mysteries. One is. And all these created great controversies and great problems, which ended up with the definition of the Mexican problem. 
which was defined by social changes here in this university. And yet, never, and despite all debates, Mexicans were never, ever included in the quotas of migration. Everybody wanted, a lot of people wanted, but they were never included, which is also a mystery. Why was there so much of a problem? Why don't include it as you did with Jews, with Chinese, with Japanese in migration quotas? Never. That's another mystery. So let me go. And in order to understand this, we have to understand, first of all, something which is very simple, but um, I want to, for you to, to see this. First of all, Chicago has never been, you know, oh, a land of, uh, you know, a, a city of immigrants and, and, and uh, America and the United States. No. We have to consider Chicago a sort of fussy of contact, clash, encounter, not for one century, since the 18th century. This is the place when the Seven Years' War, French, European, Indian from different classes, uh, General Washington, as commander of his British Majesty, was fighting against the French. And the Indians spoke French with them and English with others. And so it, this has been Le Pays de l'Illinois, has always been an area of contact of several empires and native groups, etc. Always since we have any kind of memory about it. So that is important because since, the part, uh, since uh, Chicago was just part of the West, or when St. Louis, Missouri, was finally defeated as the core of this path to the West, and Chicago became the center of industry, railroads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, that seems like, a, OK, that's interesting. Well, I want you to consider. Mexico and Mexicans are a little bit the same. It seems that Mexicans are fixed, you know. They were always beautiful Indians in the middle of nowhere. But somehow, for some tragedy or for some reason, they have to start moving. Mexicans never stop moving. Mexicans, uh, uh, the, the regions of uh, Arizona, Mexico, uh, uh, Coahuila, uh, Chihuahua, were conquered by Indians, Tlaxcalan Indians, by people of the center of Mexico who enter into contact with other Indians and with the Spaniards. There were not enough Spaniards to conquer all these lands. These Mexicans have been moving from there to here, to presidios, to railroads, to uh, uh, from the south to Mexico City, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Which then is like telling you, OK, I'm going to tell you all that story, which will be very complicated, how Mexicans have never been non-immigrants. They always are moving. Uh, now let's enter into the, gay, into the, into the movie in, at the end of the movie, which is if you see this map that I have here, you start to, uh, we start to see the answer to the question, why Chicago? By the last part of the 19th century, as the United States, uh, Mexico suffered a process of modernization and a lot of railroad construction and everything. So what you have here is the, the, the network of railroads. And as you can see, Chicago is a very important that, uh, one. And it's linked by three main lines to Mexico, which explains why Mexicans start to leave to the north. Now, most of the Mexicans that came here by the 19, uh, uh, 19, 1916 came first from Texas. They were already in Texas migrating, and then they started to be hired to come here, and then they started to, be, uh, to come more and more and more. Now, this is the beginning of the story, but the other part of the story is the coincidence of three factors around 1920. And this is what I want to concentrate on. The first factor is boom in Chicago. Chicago is booming in the 1920s, industrialization, immigration, social unrest, strikes, you name it. In 1916, there is a huge strike. In 1919, there is a huge strike. There is also, a, and it's booming, and it's one of the largest cities and more important industrial cities of the world. That's one factor. The other factor is, the unexpected significant Mexican migration exactly at that time. And the third factor is that it occurs, Mexicans and this booming city occurs in Chicago, where there is the University of Chicago, where precisely at that moment, the new science of the social science is emerging. And precisely there are these scientists in this university, in that very building over there of the social science, started and created the sociology of immigration and all the new paradigms that are going to lead 
the talking, the discussions, the debates about immigration, Mexicans, Polish, Jews, throughout the 20th century. This coincidence of the University of Chicago, the booming city, and the Mexican created the lasting idea of the Mexican problem. Now, if you see, the moment the, uh, the, the scientists started to study Mexicans, they started to notice that they all came from this part of the country, where it was very well connected to railroads. And all these Mexicans came basically for the state of Guanajuato, Zacatecas, and Michoacán. Uh, they were well, what did they find out? They found out that they were all mostly men, very young, you know, most of them, 90% uh, of them younger than 40. But here is the question, why is it a problem? They started to define it, why is it a problem? It's a problem because they suffer. That could be one of the problems, and some of the scientists here, those who work in the whole house also think, oh, it's a problem because Mexicans are suffering a lot. That's, that that's could be why it's a problem. So it also could be a problem because we, I mean Americans, suffer with the presence of Mexicans here. That could be another reason why. The other is, you know, they are too different than us. That's why they are a problem. Uh, they cannot be like us. The other problem is, the other reason they could be a problem is, we need them, but we don't like them. The other reason it could be a problem, you know, they are bar ingredient for our melting pot. They lower the salaries, they lower the moral standards, they are Catholic, and they are potentially too many. Though at that point, they were not that many. Now, the problem in the 1880s with Mexicans, it was not a problem. Of course, there is a problem. They are racially different, inferior, Catholic, lazy, greasy, and you name it. There was no problem in the 1880s. But in the 1920s, why is it a problem? And this is an extraordinary thing that happened here in the University of Chicago. The scholars started to study and start to find out and map where are they coming from? What are they doing here? What are they expecting to find? I mean, a very famous uh, uh, professor here, um, uh, Thomas, with the ayuda of Sznaniki, I don't know how to pronounce it, it was in Polish, but they published a very famous book in 1920, 1918, 1920, The Polish Peasant in Europe and America, which was a study of the Polish community in Chicago. And they created out of this the cycle of adaptation, the cycle of assimilation, which was vital in the first half of the 19th of the 20th century. How immigrants assimilate and what was the problem. So they started to study Mexicans, and here Professor Redfield started to study Mexicans in 1924, then he became a famous dean for many years here. And what they wanted to find? They wanted to find that Mexicans were, what you know, traditional, Catholic, illiterate, rural, greasy, lazy, and what did they found? That they were not illiterate. Most of them knew how to read and write. That they were not Indians. That they were not rural. Most of them came from small towns here or cities. And so the whole thing started to be complicated. So now how could you explain it? And they started to, sh to see, instead of saying they are inferior, they are a problem because they are a different race, because they are almost black or because they are Catholic, they started to talk about different uh, dichotomies, you know, what they call assimilation versus no assimilation. The problem with Mexicans is that they ought not assimilate because they started to notice something. The Mexicans come in and out. The Mexicans are not Indian. Moreover, the problem is we cannot fix them racially. They change colors. They come in all colors. Not only they come in all colors, but we define them as Indian, and then it turns out that they are not Indians. Because then they go and study them where they came from, and it turns out they are not Indians. Then they start, oh, that's the problem. They are mixed blood. They are miscegenated. And then they started to notice that they also are white, with blue eyes, some of them. Uh, and they couldn't fix it, not geographically, because they move. They started to study. Uh, here in the United States, where they came from, and they noticed, you know, oh, they are fooling California and Texas, but we know not. But look at that. By 1927, the presence of Mexicans is very high here. Why? 
They are moving everywhere. And moreover, they are not in Chicago. They are in Chicago now. Tomorrow they are in Indiana. Tomorrow they are in some other places. So they start to, like, like, like uh, fleas that move everywhere, they started to try to study that and start to define the Mexican problem. Uh, here is the problem of one of, this is a photocopy of the archives here at the university in which one of the scholars says, you know, well, maybe we have to agree with whatever I read in a survey in 1912, which says, you know, Mexicans, their lowest standards of living and of morals overbalance the desirable qualities. Of course they work, but they are not that good workers and they, they, the disadvantages are larger than the advantage to have them here. Um, so they start to study them and say, you know, the Mexican in Chicago, this is a, a manuscript here of very famous professors in the sociology department say, how are we going to study? How are we going to find out why they don't adapt? Why they don't assimilate? What is the problem? They start to say, well, they don't assimilate because they move. They come in and out. Uh, uh, and they started to realize that they had to map them. So Professor Redfield here in High Park started to see how the Mexicans were occupying the places that the Jews used to occupy. And started to map to see whether they can capture this species, which was so difficult to capture, the Mexican, because it was not like the Polish, it was not like the Jew, it was not like the German, it was not like the African American. It was weird. Uh, it was racially undesirable, but on the other, it was very difficult to fix it racially. Uh, uh, and so they start mapping and mapping and mapping as if in doing cartographies of Mexicans you can capture them finally somewhere and, and find out where they are. Uh, and so here you have all sorts of ways of mapping. All these are from the archives of the University of Chicago. Um, and they start to map them constantly in different ways. Now, the assimilation cycle seemed that uh, the uh, uh, Mexicans were not assimilating and they started to wonder why. So what did they find? They find that instead of those traditional characters that they found, they have very pragmatic characters that move everywhere. They are savvy. They are nasty. They are, what do they see? They see, for instance, that, um, that they are literate, that indeed there is discrimination, but it's not because the race is inferior, it's that the race prejudice of Americans are discriminating them. But what do they see when they go out and start to investigate in the new fashions, not by measuring their skulls as they used to do in the 1890s to find out how stupid they were by the angle of their nose, but by asking them, living with them, interviews, surveys, trying to, exp uh, to, to, to ask lots of questions to them. What do they start to find out? They start to find out that um, they, they, there is a lot of discrimination against them, that they are being segregated by houses, uh, by housing projects, etc., because people don't like them. But they also find out that Mexicans discriminate against the blacks, that Mexicans don't like blacks, that Mexicans have fights and, and, and what they call it, the, the, the riots, the small riots of the yards, because the Mexicans and Polish are always fighting. Um, that there is racialization against all. The African Americans don't like the Mexicans. The Mexicans uh, try at all costs not to be African Americans, etc., etc. They see very clearly that Mexicans dislike tremendously the role of the American woman. Uh, uh, the Mexicans, let me show you uh, at once this. The Mexicans start to write here in Chicago this tune, the last, the last one, which I was able to translate. Hasta mi vieja me la han cambiado, viste de seda reterrabón, anda pintada como una piñata, y va en las noches al dancing hall. They hated Mexicans. Th this is r these are things that these sociologists uh, uh, collected. What they start to find out? They start to find out that Mexicans dislike very much the role of the American woman, that they are too liberated for them, that they don't like how Mexican women, when they come here, start to find a job and are more independent. So they start to find all these things. And what they start to see, and I like to, to go back to this one, is that Mexicans are very well organized and they have, th by Protestant, by Catholics, uh, by music, by political positions, some of them came from expired 
uh, uh, from persecution in Mexico. Uh, and they also start to notice something very interesting. They start to notice that the Mexicans, for instance, the proof that they don't assimilate is that they don't nationalize. By the, after four or five years, all the Jews, all the Polish want to have their American nationality. Mexicans not. Why? I, uh, you have the answer. It's obvious. Why do I have to nationalize if I move in and out? Uh, but listen what some of them say. What is the Jews anyway? Some of them that were interviewed in 1920 said, can't go around wearing papers on your sleeves. How does anybody know if you have had the examination? We will still have to go upstairs in the movie houses, live in the low parts of town, and send our children to the old and ugly schools. We are still Mexicans because we look the same. So they start to find out all these things. And they start to picture them in the streets of Chicago. And see, see these guys that they found near the whole house. I like this picture very much because it so shows this Mexican street savoir faire. You see, these guys are there, and they are not going to teach them anything. They, don't know how, they know how to handle the streets of Chicago. They are not humble little Mexicans that are there. You know, let's see if uh, some Polish or some other nationality. And this is what the city was about for anybody. And these Mexicans are already very much part of the city. Um, but of course, the sociologists wanted to keep fixing them racially. So they have to do like casta paintings. You know, this is the female type of the Mexican. Memorize it so that you can recognize it. Why? Because then they won't come and ask you for a job. And you have to know whether it's Mexican or African-American or Philippine or something. Don't confuse them. OK? This is the way Mexicans look when they are babies and when they are women. Now, they also picture their pictures, uh, their parties, and everything. And here is a very important picture that came out in a very important book uh, produced uh, here in Chicago about Mexicans in Chicago, which is something that all the sociologists found, and I found in the archives, and I go through the archives, and it's there everywhere in Spanish when they spoke, when they think. When they are fighting with the Polish, they are fighting with the Jews, they are fighting. What are they fighting? For women. This is a marriage of a Mexican with a Polish. Ha! So Mexicans are sleeping with others. And that, the sociologists of Chicago did not want to say it. Why? Because after all, regardless of the reputation of a reactionary institution that has our University of Chicago, these guys, Robert Park, Robert Relfield, Thompson, all these guys were the progressive side of the equation. They wanted to study Mexicans to say it's not race inferiority, it's society, it's exploitation, it's lack of opportunity. These Mexicans are good. These Mexicans, we need them. Above all, it's inevitable. There is no possibility of avoiding their presence here. There is no way to incorporate, uh, to include it in the quotas, ever. If they have ever mentioned in 1920, 1930, 1926, 1930, 1940, or 1960, that Mexicans were sleeping, were producing miscegenation with whites in the US, no way Mexicans could be free of quotas. So this progressive uh, uh, professor, which saw in the archives that this was happening, it was such a taboo that either they couldn't see it or they didn't want to see it. But it is there, I tell you. I went through their notes. It's all there. They spoke Spanish. They are talking, you know, and marrying a Polish. Uh, the idea that Mexicans have a taboo and all these men along in Chicago were just waiting for their little Mexicans to come to marry, it's, it's a good story. And if they could wait, they will wait. But they will not wait, um, how could I say it, uh, with their hands over the other hand, just like this, waiting. Um, so this is uh, the story. Besides, it's not only that Mexicans started to be here as workers creating all these problems. This definition of the Mexican problem, I want you to understand that it's a very progressive definition. They are a problem because they don't assimilate, because they move a lot, because there are all these racist arguments against them. But they are not inferior. They are wonderful workers. Uh, but on the other hand, you have to avoid talking about miscegenation because of the reasons I just told you. But also, Mexico's, uh, Chicago started, thanks to the University of Chicago and this coincidence of the booming city, the University of Chicago and the Mexicans, Chicago started to become a capital for Mexicans intellectuals to come. 
and talk. And this is famous Mosei Sanz, one of the most important uh, 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 intellectuals of the first half of the 19th century, uh, of, the, of the 20th century, who was here teaching in the University of Chicago. And here is a picture of him. Here is another picture with other famous professors here. And the most important intellectual of the 20th century, uh, Jose Vasconcelos, came to, make to Chicago and taught in the University of Chicago, wrote in the Spanish newspapers of Chicago. Uh, and here you have it. It's not only that Chicago was uh, and as it is today. Mexico, Chicago is a Mexican city just because it's full of Mexican janitors. It's also full of Mexican doctors. It's also full of Mexican intellectuals. It's also full of Mexican professors. Uh, and, and it was that case, too, because it was such an important capital. Um, and in order to finish with some kind of conclusion uh, my talk, I want you to leave you with some paper that I found there. I want you to read the first part in which basically in 1920 when these uh, researchers were doing this, uh, uh, were already seeing what is the problem. Mexico problems and Mexico's achievements become ours by the very law of propinquity and the rapidity and extent of our progress is to a very considerable extent conditioned by, uh, by hers. We are man and wife by common law, marriage, and no international divorce school can ever issue a decree which will separate our interests. This is 1926, when there were only 20,000 Mexicans here. When will this be accepted? But we need more than a million Mexicans here. Thank you very much. I'm Sarah Lopez. I'm a, a postdoc in the history department. Thank you all for being here. Professor Tenorio just presented on Mexicans in Chicago in the early 20th century, the rise of the Mexican problem, all linked to a time when Mexicans lived largely in the south of the city near steel factories and other industry a time dominated by the construction of these ethnic distinctions that we just learned about. My talk turns to the everyday placemaking and architecture of migration to explore where Mexican migrants and their children have lived post-World War II and their role in constructing Chicago's built environment. I will outline historic moments when specific kinds of placemaking prevailed, patterns emerged. I will then discuss a very recent development in Mexican Chicago, the building of new migrant meeting halls to show how the built environment reveals a shift from migrant integration into Chicago to a transnational space, exposing the binational processes that are currently underpinning American urbanism. So first, why look at the built environment, at architecture? Architecture is not merely representational or aesthetic. Buildings, in the words of Arijit Sen, quote, may indeed be products of culture, but once built, they exert some influence and limitations on the ways we live in them, right? Architecture is especially valuable as an index of social change. Personal projects have public implications. Public projects shape not only streets and neighborhoods, but people's fundamental ways of relating to the city and to one another. In sum, architecture is a social and cultural product of society. Within Chicago, Pilsen and Little Village are known as iconic Mexican neighborhoods. Both transitioned from largely Bohemian, Lithuanian, Polish to Mexican. And this happened over the course of several decades. Pilsen and Little Village became an arrival city for incoming Mexicans that were coming directly from Mexico and Mexicans moving from other parts of Chicago. The population of Mexicans, though, in Pilsen and Little Village really doesn't take off until the 70s because of the expansion of the UIC campus. And by the 1980s, the neighborhood is 78% Hispanic, with 32,000 uh, Mexicans living there. However, unlike the gentrification processes you, we, we witness today, Mexicans did not move in and price out those living in the area. The population of Pilsen had been declining steadily since the 1920s, with a population loss of about 4,500 people per decade. From 85,000 at its height in 1920 to less than 45,000 in 1970, Mexicans moved into a neighborhood that was already in transition, right, as many Eastern European families were moving to the suburbs. Mexicans inherit, inherited a very dynamic urban fabric. Tenements were dotted with bohemian monuments to theater, such as Thelia Hall, which still stands on 18th Street um, at, at Thousand Cedar Opera House, and uh, religious monuments, such as St. Procopius. 
The architecture of early immigrants created spaces that subsequent groups have operated in a similar fashion, creating cultural continuity in a neighborhood that's marked by cultural disjuncture. So for example, St. Procopius Church, modeled off of churches found in Germany and Eastern Europe, but built with common Chicago brick, took almost 10 years to erect and was finished in 1883. And it was not until 1961 that sermons took place in a language other than Czech or English. In 1961, the father brought the first Mexican priest to do Don Venas to the Virgin of Guadalupe. By 1963, they had the image of the Virgin of Guadalupe inside the church, and five years later, she was in the garden, which is the slide you see next to the church. Placing the, the image of the Virgin on the street, you know, publicly announced Pilsen as Mexican. It put difference on display at that time. Throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s, Mexican residents' grassroots efforts resulted in new institution building in Pilsen. Not long after St. Procopius spoke Spanish, Mexicans took charge over the original Bohemian settlement house, the Howell House, became Casa Aslan. According to the current director of Casa Aslan, um, in the 1970s, a young group of single men who at the time were called solos uh, went to a conference allegedly in Denver, Colorado called Cruzada por la Justicia, uh, this is the time of the Brown Berets, where they learned about Aslan, where they learned about the Treaty of Guadalupe, where they had a sort of educational awakening about a uh, somewhat mythologized past. And claiming Aslan, the legendary home of the Nahuatl people, allowed young Mexicans a reference to reference a lineage that predates this colonial era. But the remarkable thing for me about this building is that today, 100 years after the settlement house opened as Bohemian, Casa Aslan still holds citizenship and English classes on the third and fourth floors. Other institutional spaces are the library, Benito Juarez School, and the US's only National Museum of Mexican Art. Here too, activists in the neighborhood engaged in the construction of a Mexican identity. The original designs for the high school uh, and museum were importantly influenced by Mexicans from Mexico. It was very important that they were from Mexico, such as Professor Tenorio, not a Mexican Chicago person, um, architects. In the school, the geometries of the elevation were meant to evoke a pre-Columbian temple, which you can see there as the, the elevations are not right angles. That's, that's the geometry I'm talking about. Both the library and the museum use a motif that is a direct quote from a pre-Columbian Olmec palace in Milta, Oaxaca. And you see here, that is the library in Pilsen and the National Museum and you see here the palace in Oaxaca, um, dating from approximately 1000 CE, all connoting historical moments that predate hyphenated individuals. In these examples, we can see disparate understandings of what it means to be Mexican American and how Mexicans' place in Chicago was legitimized through distant geographic and temporal references. The formality of institutions contrasts with the pattern and textured Mexican st streetscapes. Signage, quotidian placemaking, noted by historian David Hankin as urban text, marks the possibilities and limits of understanding a new urban environment, of engaging a place where one can function without necessarily having personal contacts, a place where one both does and does not belong. Signs also allow migrant communities to broadcast services, a means towards really constructing a migrant public. So here's an example of a grocery store uh, in Little Village uh, calling out Aguas Calientes, uh, regional specificity, and nearby, the owner of a restaurant painted Avenida Mexico. This is also not called Avenida Mexico. This is on 26th Street as well. And of course, we're all aware of the murals. Commenced in the 1970s and still painted today, murals unwittingly expose a central tension in the neighborhood of Pilsen. They construct a narrative both about rootedness and migrancy, revealing the extent to which Pilsen itself is a space of migration. So you see here on the First slide, the faces, this is a tortilla factory, and these are the faces of workers um, inside the factory painted for the public to see, sort of building a rootedness. And you see a sort of post 9-11 representation of migration here. This is uh, pulling from the idea of Gulliver's travels. Gulliver is the migrant who is ensnared in barbed wire here uh, in his travels. And that is painted by a migrant from Michoacan who lives in and owns that house. All of this material evidence has captured the attention of city officials in both Chicago and Mexico. In 1991, the Mexican government subsidized the building of the Little Village Archway, extending their reach into America's uh, third largest city. And in 1999, the mayor of Mexico City donated the Mexican Eagle that sits at the heart of Pilsen today. 
Chicago city planners and developers have also had a hand in constructing narratives of Mexicanness. The Aztec seals, terracotta tiles, and plaza in Pilsen were implemented and funded, allegedly, I'm still researching this, uh, by Mayor Daley's thematic neighborhoods project, where he donated $2 million to give a facelift to Pilsen and add a Mexican touch to 18th Street. These cumulative efforts, evidence of investment in neighborhoods, have resulted in a Mexican Chicago that is currently witness to a new phase in urban development and migrant architecture, which we'll turn to now. Namely, many incoming migrants are not necessarily coming to stay. Their focus has shifted from looking into an American dream to looking outward towards a Mexican dream that they hope to build in Mexico. Uh, contemporary migrants are not necessarily aspiring Americans. Now, I say that knowing that migrant ambivalence and coming back and forth between Mexico and the United States has been happening as long as Mexicans have been here, as we've just reviewed in the previous uh, lecture. But since the 1980s, an increasing number of families have come and an increasing number of families are spread across geographies. And so there's been an intensification of these linkages. Migrant remittance transfer centers have spread throughout Chicago. For example, they're one source of evidence we have. The original transfer centers were all located in Pilsen and Little Village, and now you can find them in all of the suburbs. The 20, million, the 20 billion plus dollars migrants send home yearly in remittances has captured the attention of the Mexican government and the financial sector. And migrant activism has expanded from addressing immediate injustices, such as things that Casa Aslan would have um, addressed, in host cities to enacting social change in home countries. And all of this influences placemaking and the production of Mexican Chicago. In terms of the built environment, new migrant casas or meeting houses are material manifestations of the binational processes underpinning American life. Um, unlike Casa Aslan, which we looked at, which focuses on social and political incorporation into Chicago, um, the new casas work towards goals in the hometown, and their names reflect this, right? So the casas today are organized by Mexican state. You see here Casa Jalisco, Casa Michoacán, Casa Guerrero, Casa Zacatecas. Let's take a closer look at two of the casas today um, in Chicago. The logic of their construction and maintenance reveals contemporary migrant aspirations and introduces a new mode of migrant incorporation that, that is much more dialectical, much more about a both and, both in and of the US and in and of Mexico. Ostensibly, Casa Michoacan, which is located in Pilsen, in the heart of, of the iconic Mexican neighborhood, is a migrant meeting hall serving the needs of migrant clubs and their umbrella organization or federation. It's a place to gather, to hold events. Um, it's also a, an art house. They have art hanging on the walls. The Federation of Michoacanos bought and remodeled a church, this building previously was a church, with their funds and a one-time donation from their state government of Michoacan. Architecturally, the open room is the most critical component, typically associated with democratic institutional spaces or educational settings. The open hall makes public, renders permissible, and affords privacy to migrant meetings and affairs. And the building's adjacency to the street, which we just looked at in the previous slide, contributes to its reputation as the most successful casa para todos, or house for everybody. The materials migrants use to remodel and represent the casas does the important work of placing migrants in American cities through their attachments to hometowns. By publicly asserting regional identities in an American city, migrants stake claim to both places. In Casa Michoacan, owned and operated by the Migrant Federation, these artists and objects are on display or you see the US and Mexican uh, flags stand side by side. Mexican laborers, carpenters, and painters donated time to remodel this main space. And several items such as pine wood carved and imported from Tsingtunsan, Michoacan decorate its walls. This wood is a part of an origin narrative. It's believed that this tree only grows in Canada, the US, Michoacan, and the Efe because of bee pollination. Another phenomena that materially links Michoacan with the US and with Chicago is the annual migration of monarch butterflies. Down the street from Casa Michoacan, the Federation has built a small urban garden with milkweed to lure the butterflies en route from Michoacan to Chicago, see if they can make a, a, a small temporary um, dip into their garden here in Chicago. The Federation represents these links on the cover of their annual magazine. Chicago skyline and Morelia's Basilica are married by butter fluttering butterflies, symbolizing both regional specificity and freedom of mobility. 
The Casa serves an important psychological function for Michoacanos. The president of the Michoacan Federation notes, we have many important activities in the Casa from educational, social, environmental, political. The main reason we built it though is to make migrants proud. We had meetings in the basements of churches, in my house on milk crates. The Casa is to give dignity to migrants who are perceived as poor and ignorant. It's also interestingly a transnational space. And just to look quickly at this plan, uh, just one part of it, the government uh, in Michoacan has assisted in the creation of what they call Plaza Comunitaria, which is basically allowing adult Mexican migrants here to complete basic education in Mexico and get a Mexican diploma by t going to classrooms in Pilsen and taking these classes. So let's contrast this Casa Michoacan briefly now to Casa Jalisco, another example. Not located in Pilsen, but located in a suburb, uh, Melrose Park. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Melrose Park. It's very west of the city. And you can see here in a census map, this is just representing um, Hispanic Latino population is in orange. And you can see this is from, from 2010, um, how west they've moved. In Melrose Park 30 years ago, the Hispanic population was 10%, and today it is 70. And this is also reflected in the architecture of the suburb. Um, so you can see here, it was a once Italian, now Mexican dominant community, and here on Lake Street is the Italian flag with the Tolkien sidewalk. And across, it's right across the street from um, the same colors of the Mexican Los Comales, which is a Mexican chain uh, food restaurant. And you see here, a lot of the stores have been um, now inhabited by Mexican businesses, broadcasting regional specificity also on the car. Casa Jalisco is not a migrant meeting hall, but rather a state migrant innovation intended to create a Jalisco without borders here in Chicago. Inaugurated in 2009, the only casa in the US owned and fully funded by a Mexican state, uh, Jalisco, the casa is a $5 million project that's paid for by Jalisco taxpayers. So in contrast to Casa Michoacan, um, the main entry space is a cluster of formal offices. When you walk right in, this is what you see. You don't go into kind of that open hall that's a multi-use space. There's also a trade gallery on the left um, for showcasing items from Jalisco, tequila, um, so that they can actually foment trade, and a private meeting room. And you see here a photograph of the architectural plan of Casa Jalisco, which has one of the offices labeled governor's office. It is an office indeed for the governor of Jalisco when and if he should come visit us in Chicago. The most important space, the Grand Salon, is upstairs, the multi-use space. There's also a built-in wooden bar, um, which allows the migrant community to hold weddings and quinceañeras here. And the Federation of Migrants has to work very hard to make this place feel like home because it is such a monumental building. Now you might ask, why is the government of Jalisco paying for its migrants to have a clubhouse in an American suburb? Jalisco's government legitimizes its investment through the economic potential of the migrant economy. According to a statesman spearheading the project, we're most interested in the potential of the migrant entrepreneurs and the second generation. The second generation is an invaluable resource. They're working at Mac and IBM and they want to connect with Jalisco. He further explains, migrants children have asked, how can we love Mexico if we don't know it? The answer, he said, you can't. You have to know it first. We have to bring Jalisco here for those who can't go there. The state is hoping that a Marca Jalisco will be born. Made in Jalisco rather than made in Mexico will assert Jalisco as a good place to invest in an increasingly competitive global economy. The Casa houses the largest binational trade show to date where the video, Jalisco, the Silicon Valley of Mexico, was recently shown. Jalisco as a brand seeks to capitalize on the fragmentation of its people Mexicans who are already locating new frontiers for expansion. And we see um, the state uh, migrant alliance here with the statue of Minerva, which is located in Guadalajara. And the governor donated a duplicate of this statue, also made by the same sculptress, um, for the Casa Jalisco here in Melrose Park. So it's now located um, on Lake Street. I started this talk with the historic construction of pills in the commercial spaces of Little Village as two neighborhoods where migrants, first and second generation Mexicans have shaped the built environment. I bring our attention to placemaking to the distinction between signs remodeling government funded archways because architecture in the built environment at, at large is a stage for the drama of everyday life. But within the context of multiple generations of Mexican Americans and new incoming migrants, that stage is harder and harder to decipher. The migration of people grates against the stasis of the built world. 
Buildings endure long past their social contexts fade. By scrutinizing the landscape, we can begin to perceive a more structural and fundamental change to the production of Mexican Chicago that reveals something about Chicago at large and our American way of life. The citizenship classes, ESL classes, and formal dances of Casa Aztlan now coexist with the Plaza Comunitaria at Casa Michoacan. The mom and pop stores along 18th and 26th and Cermac that catapulted some families into the middle class vie for attention with remittance businesses and transnational enterprises that are facilitating extra local change. Chicago's transnational spaces not only reveal something about migrants changing aspirations, but they also beg the question, how welcoming is Chicago today to its newcomers versus 20, 50, 100 years ago? Which newcomers? Is transnational space in Mexican Chicago, such as these new casas or the remittance centers, a solution to contemporary migration? Or is it the seeds of a new Mexican problem? Thank you. <laughs>